Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, the 17th of October. Today's topic is green screens plus iPads equals magic. Our special guest today is Jennifer Garcia. Your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, and Tammy Moore. Thank you to Tammy for doing the closed captioning, and also thank you to Patty Ruffing for doing a new introduction to, to Classroom 2.0 Live that's on the website. I'm going to turn the mic over to Maureen, who will now introduce Jennifer for us and ask the newbie question. Thanks, Lori. Um, I first met Jennifer virtually through her Better World project. This was a project that she created at her school in El Salvador and that my former school joined in 2010 and contributed to for uh, three years. It was based on the UN Millennium Goals, but I finally got to meet Jennifer in person at ISTE, and I honestly can't remember which ISTE it was. It was either in Denver, Philly, or San Diego, but Jennifer is an amazing global collaborator. Originally from Canada, she has worked as a teacher since 1994 in both primary and secondary schools at the, I'm going to mess up how you say this, the ABC school, the Academia Britannica Kozkadlatka, and you'll have to correct my pronunciation later. Um, she is the learning resources coordinator and a secondary school ICT teacher. As such, she is responsible for running the Learning Resource Center, teaching ICT to 6th through 8th grades, and developing staff training and cross-curricular initiatives, as well as offering digital media support to staff and students. She is a Google innovator, as well as being a Google trainer. It is such a pleasure to have her here with us today to share her learning. So I'm going to ask her the newbie question and turn it over to Jennifer. So Jennifer, what is a green screen and how does it work? Over to you. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here with you this morning. Um, a green screen is basically, it can be many different things. Um, but green screen or chroma keying is a way of adding special effects to images and, and video. And what it lets you do basically is remove the background from an image or a video and place another image or video as the background for that particular one. And you end up with uh, two, maybe even three layers, as you'll see later on in, in the presentation. You can do it with green. You can do it with blue. It does depend on the particular hue or value of those colors. I've even tried playing around a bit with yellows. And at sometimes that works quite well for me, too. But we tend to stick more with the blue or the green. And the reason is it works really well with, with human skin colors. You can actually see them much better when you're using a blue or green as opposed to other colors in the spectrum. Anyway, we've been using green screens for an awfully long time, probably about the last seven years, but we've been using them in different ways. Um, since I started the LRC eight years ago, we've been doing animation work, and we started off with some really basic stuff. Um, we had IMAX in there, and that was pretty much it. And so what we did was we had um, those big cardboard boxes that they used to sell paper in at like Office Depot and places like that, and the kids would decorate them inside, uh, add green hues to them, and we'd sit these on a pile of books in front of our computers and snap the shots using photos booth and stick them on it into iMovie afterwards to create our animations. It didn't work that well, but it was an interesting introduction to it for the kids. Um, I think our biggest issue there was the lighting. Anyway, we got iPads a few years back, and we started using um, our iPads for our presentations. And I'm just going to move, sorry, I'm not moving around. Um, and we started using them for our, our presentation work as well as our video work and any digital imagery we were doing. And you can see it, the, the setup in the center here on a tripod. We, we've tried so many different ways of getting our iPad set up to do green screen. And there's a, in this picture, you can see there's a green screen curtain in the background. We bought a few different kits on Amazon with lighting and everything included, which were great because we didn't know a whole lot about it at the time, so it could, they came with everything we needed. Um, but we've tried quite a few different things with it. I'm going to share two different projects um, with you this in this session that we've been doing recently, um, we 
we discovered, I discovered Doink last year actually um, through a tweet that came through from um, EdTech Teacher and I, it just blew me away. It was, that, it, was a, it was really appropriate timing and I'll get back to that later. But uh, one of our projects that we do is an animation project which is the one we've been working on since way back when we used those boxes in IMAX and another one is when we started last year. Um, which we began using as part of a cross-collaborative initiative with Humanities. Again, more on that in just a bit. But really, when we discovered Doink and the ability to green screen on the iPads, it was one of those wow moments. I'd been looking for something like this for the longest time because up until that point what we'd been doing is taking our shots on the iPads, getting them into the cloud somehow or emailing the, you know, the old school way, which was really clunky and took a lot of bandwidth, um, over to the IMAX where the kids would then download them, put them to iMovie and do the green screen or blue screen effects. And it just wasn't a very efficient method of doing things. We wanted to make our project whole iPad wherever possible. Um, this is one uh, screenshot. It's an, there's a link that Peggy's going to, she has in the live binder and she'll put it in the chat as well, I guess, um, to the actual video. This is an example of one of those projects that we've done. This is the newest one. Last year, we um, every year we actually do a, an activity with Humanities where they investigate um, the Pompeii, uh, the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in Pompeii and also a similar eruption that happened in El Salvador. And they, they do um, research, they produce a video, et cetera, et cetera. And we've tried lots of different things in the past. And this year, I was looking for something a little bit different. And I came across that tweet I mentioned, which showed me how to create a Harry Potter movie newspaper. And I just went, wow, that's exactly what we need to do. And so what we did was um, I, I investigated a little bit more online and, and put a unit together for them, which took them right through the whole process of investigating, doing their research, taking notes, writing newspaper articles, advice on writing newspaper articles, etc. Gave them some templates to use. And I'll, I'll show you all of that in a few minutes because these projects, it's, it's not just about, it can be, but it's not just about usually taking my iPad or the kids taking their iPad, taking some shots and green screen. There's a lot of build up to it. There's a lot of workflow things to consider. And generally when we do these projects, we're doing them with five classes at a time. So we have to keep things super organized to keep it uh, working properly. Anyway, moving on. This is an example from our latest animation carousel. It's a very simple little example. And the interesting thing about this one is that the students um, used a combination of green screen technology and um, a paper backdrop to create their video. I, as you can see, there's this sort of a red brick road. That's actually a part of a paper printout, whereas the rest of it is, apart from the props, is, has been superimposed on the video using green screen technology. And it's also interesting because our, this, this particular group had a really hard time keeping their camera still. And we were able to, with using Doink's um, green screen app and iMovie on the iPads, we were able to chop things up enough that we could eliminate some of that uh, movement that the kids had in their video, as well as um, really, really zoom in um, and crop out portions of the video where we needed to. And now we used uh, green screen by doing to do that as well. Anyway, there's a link there to the project if you'd like to view. It's a very short one, um, but it's, it's a cool one. And the kids really worked hard on it. You can see they've even made the, some of their own little props out of uh, there's some plasticine heads on the Lego and things and have great fun with this. This is a super short example, but again, it's, it demonstrates full green screen. And in the background, you can see that they've placed a busy street as their background of their video. And in the actual video, the letters move around and, and turn and stuff. It's, um, it's quite fun. The kids really get carried away with their props and, and creating them. And there's a whole section of the project that's dedicated for them to create their props. And uh, again, I'll take you through that in just a few minutes. We learned a lot about setup. We learned a lot about workflow. and um, way early on in all of our teaching through the LRC, we, we learned that we needed a website. Um, first, it was a website just to put links on for the kids. And later, it was posting online lessons, templates, et cetera. And that's where we're at now. And so basically, um, this is what we've been doing for the latest um, projects. Now, this is the tweet I mentioned earlier that just got me so excited about this. It came through. The, in an evening, on an evening, sorry. And the next morning I had a meeting with the humanities department about the project. I said, you know what? I just came across something that's going to blow you guys away. And we talked about it. And then right there, the, the project was created. Everybody was on board. And it worked out really, really well this year for our students. This is an example of those online lessons I mentioned. We have um, a main website, which is our hub. And then we have, like I said, lessons that are linked to it as well as templates. And I just put a screenshot of one of the templates there for you because as I mentioned earlier, it is a, a process. We don't just 
in ICT at our school, we try not to just teach the ICT. We, we make it a more um, complete process for the kids. They, they start with the research. We teach them skills for researching. We, we, we use every single part of the project as a teachable moment, basically, and whenever possible, link it to the other subjects in our school. And so you can see this is just a brief um, screenshot, a very small screenshot of what the template uh, looks like at the beginning, where the kids have different spots to, to fill in their information. And we get these out to the kids through different, measure, through different um, applications, which I'll mention later on in the session. Again, a few more screenshots uh, from the student workbook, which we push out to them. And this is where they respond in their groups, and sometimes depending on the project individually, with, uh, we put tutorials in there. We check their responses. They, they reflect. And it's quite a nice way to keep a project moving along and provide the students with what they need um, for the project. We, um, we try to keep all of our stuff together, all of our videos, digital video work, um, everything in little collections up until uh, last year, actually, I was using YouTube an awful lot. I have a YouTube channel, and I would put all of their videos up there. And I still do that, but I also found that with the students, it's much easier for me to use Google Drive for them to store their media and upload their media to and download from. It is a bandwidth issue when it comes to Wi-Fi at times, but we're fortunate in that we actually have pretty decent Wi-Fi at our school this year, and so it's working very smoothly. And so we create a, a folder for the students, and they upload their media to it, and that thereby allows us to collect all of their stuff together in one place, all of their videos, and then do what we'd like to with those videos, whether it's putting on YouTube, sharing them with their school privately. And it gives us those um, sharing options. I can share privately with people just at the school, or depending on what I want to do with the media, share it with the whole world. A um, little plug for Google here. <laughs> we are a Google Apps school, and uh, to be honest, I don't think we could do a lot of what we do without Google Apps, um, especially Google Drive. It is the mainstay of ev most of what we do in ICT. Almost everything we do is deeply embedded somewhere within <laughs> Google Drive. And it, if you don't, if haven't looked at it yet or you haven't used it yet, I, I strongly suggest investigating um, it for your school. It, it will really facilitate any workflow that you're doing with the kids. It'll, it'll give you a place where you can post their work and where you can work from with them, at, uh, plus a few extras, which I'll share with you after. This is um, the process for the animation uh, project. Um, basically, the kids have a Google Doc template or one that they created their own in, on their own in the past. This year, we've given them templates. And the beauty of this, I think, is that um, not only can they write collaboratively and prepare the scripts and the stories for their digital video work or any other digital storytelling they're doing, but it allows you to engage in a conversation with them online through comments and through suggestions. And I just put a little example here of some comments that went back and forth between myself and one of my students during the, um, the process. The next one is an example of a suggesting option. So not only can I comment back and forth, but I can also add suggestions. Without changing what the student has written, I can say, you know, maybe you should change this to that or spell this differently. And, and then they resolve it with a little tick and say, oh, yeah, that, that makes sense. I'll fix that. So it's, again, it's another way to engage in this process, in the writing process with the students over a period of time. Our, te our planning template this year looks a bit like this. In fact, it looks exactly like this, only this is the very top part of it. And um, this is where the students each have a section of the story. I've only included the first section, the beginning, as the stories are broken down to bit beginning, middle, and end. And they all have a certain role to play when they're writing the story after having several discussions on it and choosing their storyline. We try to link our stories to our school values and traits, which is a big push we have at our school. So they choose one of those and build, or maybe more, usually it's one or two max, and build their stories around those values and traits. And you can see there's the, the, the part of the template where the first person writing the story um, does their actual written work. This is um, a storyboard template, which I sent out to them all, my second group this year. When, apart from um, this, we used to, in the past, including the first carousel this year, use paper storyboards. I tried digital storyboards a few years ago, and I didn't find I had much success with them with the students. This year, I have high hopes. I came across this one just recently, and I put the link for the original template there where I, I found it. And I, I modified it. I modified it to fit the needs that we had um, for our particular project. And it's a, it's a really great way of getting the kids to use their computers and to write collaboratively once again, add their ideas, and they can see each other's work as they're going. But the problem with paper storyboards, I guess, is that you've got to 
give everybody in the group a copy first because otherwise one person will sit back and or two and perhaps not do as much as they should. But also, um, there's less of a feeling of collaboration because they're all working on their own sections sort of exclusively while they're still part of the group. This way they can see what everybody's doing at the same time. I'm going to move forward on this one and show you um, an example of a storyboard drawing um, using stick figures. It, took me, I don't know, 30 seconds to put this thing together. And basically, that's what we're looking for. When I move back, I'm just going to move the slide back a sec. In those little boxes that you see in scene A, B, and C, that's what we're looking for from the students, basically. Uh, some ideas for their backdrops, as well as stick figures that they can um, write, draw into their, their storyboards, just to indicate things like movement, position, um, shots, angles, etc. We have a rubric which we use. It's actually quite a long rubric, and the kids are shared into this as well, so they can monitor their work throughout the process, as can we. Um, we, again, uh, used to use strictly paper copies of these. I'll show you one in a second. And the teachers also had a paper copy where they took notes as the, pro the process um, moved forward. This year, we've given them digital copies to annotate within that same um, notebook that we've given them for the project where they write their reflections and do their storyboarding and everything. Um, you can see it's quite long, but they can annotate it on the go. And I've tried to highlight key terminology for them as well, because that's important that they learn the terminology related to what they're doing. And this is an example, just a brief example of an annotated um, story, or sorry, a rubric that the kids have created. This year, we're going to use the digital version, and we're going to use Gubrick uh, to do it. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Gubrick, but if you're not, it's a fantastic add-on um, for Google that you can, it's free, and you can and give it a play with your students. It allows you to basically place a rubric on their doc, whatever they're writing on, and score them on the go. And then you can go back and modify as well. It's a great way to show them how they're progressing through a project. This is our online hub. We have all of our lessons online, um, so the kids can go there 24-7, see what's happening, what they need to do, how they can um, improve their work, do tutorials. Uh, if they miss a day of school, it's all there as well. And we've also got our Google Classroom there. More on Google Classroom in just a few minutes. An uh, example of the online lessons for animation right there. It's just the beginning of it. But you can see how it's sort of set up with um, different classes, different lessons, links, tutorials, and other resources for the students. And then we link to those. Uh, lessons as well with templates. And this is the one for the work that we did with DOINC at the end of the school year last year with the humanities department. And we provide them with what they need to get the project together to plan every, every step in the project. And we try to scaffold them as best as we can through this as well. Some of the options we use for online lessons, um, we use Google Classroom quite a bit. I'll talk to you about that just briefly to get work out to students and to monitor their work. Uh, Doctopus is another amazing add-on. It's the best if you're trying to use Google, uh, any Google documents with your students in groups or you'd like to differentiate. Um, this is the way to do it. You can't really do that through Classroom yet. And all of our stuff is on Wikispaces. We are a Google Apps school, and I do have quite a few Google sites, but I actually prefer Wikispaces. I started with them years ago, and they're just the freedom they allow me in creating my online lessons is just, you can't compare it to anything that I think that you can get elsewhere. <laughs> but that's a personal thing. Um, Workflow with Google Classroom, getting this stuff out to the kids. Basically, you create your own classes. And within that, you can add announcements, reuse posts, create short questions for them to answer, send out templates, send out rubrics. And you can see in this example here, we've sent out a review for how to use iMovie with green screens and with, uh, sorry, with green screen and animation as a digital storytelling rubric that they were using for the assignment. And you can communicate back and forth through email, et cetera, through the stream as well. Uh, the Google add-ons again, just another mention on that. Doctopus, fantastic. So it's strongly suggest if you've not explored it yet. And um, it lets you basically create that structure, the file structure, where you can have folders where kids can view the content only, folders where students can uh, collaborate and add content, and folders where the teacher holds the student files in, and the students have their own file as well within their own folders. So it's, it's quite a nice way to manage it. And there's access where you can add uh, notes, comments, grades, and you can find the last edit for it, what was the last time and day that they edited the document, et cetera. Really great way of managing a project like this. Uh, this is just a screenshot of the file system, and you can see how it, it's set up, basically. I've got four folders across the, the top here, mine being the teacher one. Class view, they can see everything I put in there, but they can't edit it. And class edit, where they can edit anything, add stuff to it, etc. And that's where you'd put your file for your, your final projects. 
and this is the share, these are the sharing options within Doctopus. Again, Google Classroom will not allow you to do all of these things yet. I'm hoping they will soon, but individual differentiated and project groups are the two parts that we use a lot when we're doing this kind of work with our students. If you try and do this through Classroom, what you end up with is a whole pile of orphaned files that, um, because the groups only need one and every student has been shared a file that they can edit. They've got a whole pile that are just sitting there not being used and you've got to dig through them to see which ones are in fact in use and it just becomes a bit unwieldy to manage. Last year when we did this work, we were still using our tripods. It was, um, we, we'd, we'd actually gone through so many tripods in the last three years and I bought some super heavy duty Ravelli ones last year and that's what you're seeing in that first image there. And even at that, my kids have found ways to destroy them, not on purpose, I don't think it was intentional, but they're, they're very hard on the equipment. Luckily the iPads haven't suffered yet and they're a few years old. But we, we tried different systems for attaching our iPads to the tripods so that we could get the right angle and, and make them mobile enough that the kids could, you know, take their shots on the table if they wanted to or use the green screen and do pixelation with human bodies moving instead uh, and props. And you'll see a few examples of what we've used in the past. These are, these are great, um, but we had issues with them, well, the one in the middle would fall apart if we tightened it too much against the iPads, it would come off, it would pop off. And the second one we found that because our students are, you know, they're quite young, they're still seventh grade, they're a bit rough on the equipment, things would loosen up on them very quickly. So this year we had another solution which we put in place and this is what it is. And I like this because it doesn't matter what kind of tablet you have, you can clip it on there. Um, we can use it with our minis and we can use it with our full size iPads. Not only that, it's a gorilla type tripod so it lets me, you can see in the picture, it lets me move the legs any way I want to create the kind of angle and stability that I need for that particular um, project and yes, tripods are extremely important especially with animation because what happens if they move the tripod around too much or the, or the iPad around without a tripod which is even worse then you've got huge jumps in your animation which just makes it very difficult to watch. Um, these are some setup options. We, this year we, we started a bit late with our new green screen um, desk. We had a, a huge long desk made where six different groups can work at the same time and we covered that with um, bulletin board foam. And then we had the guys come in at our school and we found a paint color which was pretty close to what we needed and we had them paint the whole thing but it wasn't quite finished when we did our first carousel this time around. So the kids started off with green floors but they needed, and their backdrops were actually printouts at the beginning for some of the groups. Some of the groups actually started uh, taking their shots when the, the green on their section of the table was ready to go. So you see a combination in the stuff that we did in our very first nine week carousel. This time around we've started and with full green screen because everything set up and ready to go but you can also see how the kids uh, got creative using paper of different hues to give them that particular hue that they needed for their project. I can't stress, this is seventh grade, yes, I can't stress how important it is to get the lighting right as well um, when you're green screening and to ensure that your um, your backdrop, whether it's paper or, or material, is, is nice and tight against whatever surface or is hanging properly. The, the more wrinkles in it and folds, um, the less clear your chroma keen will be. Anyway, moving forward. Dollar stores. I don't know how many of you love dollar stores. I love dollar stores. As a teacher, they are a lifesaver, I think. They, they really allow us to to buy the bits and pieces that we need for our projects and one of the things I love most about dollar stores are their storage options. Um, those lovely bins that they sell are fantastic for keeping student props safe and sound, adding their storyboards and you can see we've labeled them by group, um, yeah, Euro stores, that's cool and um, it really just helps us to keep everything in its place and, and avoid having things lost or destroyed and we made our green screen stations this year. We had a shelf put in at the bottom where the kids could then um, stick their boxes of props while they were not in use for the actual um, project. This is, these are, sorry, um, some examples of the apps that 
most of these we've played with in the past. The doe link I'm showing you here is their animation and drawing app. That one we've not actually trialed yet. We've um, we used doe link for the, the shots and for doing the green screen. But this is another one that they offer, which I'm really interested in trying out. And if anybody here has actually used it, I'd, be lovely, I'd love to hear back from you. We've used Animation Desk in the past with our students. And it's a free one. And I'll tell you, they either love it or they hate it. And that's because some kids really love to draw. And the kids who love to draw love Animation Desk. And it lets them do some amazing animation work um, through drawing with a stylus or their finger if that's how they want to go. But if they're not really into that, they can get really frustrated by it, um, which is why we give our kids options. They can draw out their animations. They can use paper cutouts. They can use Legos. They can use a combination of Legos and paper cutouts. They can use plasticine and anything else that they can come across that they think would work really well um, for their animations. They even use themselves for what we call pixelation, which is stop motion but with a human being um, doing the movements and the shots being taken. Telegami on the right-hand side there our our project, our volcano project, wouldn't have worked without this. This is so important um, when it comes to doing the work that we did with the moving newspapers. It, it allows you to create one of the very important layers for the project. Um, you have a layer where there's a video. In our case, we had a volcano exploding in the background. And yet, we had the telegami layer, which was the, it allows me to choose a talking avatar and design it a little bit, make it more uh, look more like the, the students want it to look like. And then they, they actually speak at the same time as recording, and the avatar, when it plays back, is speaking for them. And so it's delivering the newscast. And they do this with that green screen hue in the background. All right, That becomes the second layer in the project. And then the top layer is actually a Google Doc template, which I created for them, in which they have um, written their news reports which you would have seen at that first screenshot that I showed you. And they've written their news reports, their actual news reports in the template, added their headlines and all of that, and exported it as a picture or taken a screenshot of it. That becomes their top layer for it. And then they put the three pieces together. We use iStop Motion on our iPads to capture our shots. Um, the beauty of this is it keeps it all organized in order. There's nothing, nothing worse than it. Um, a student taking a bunch of shots for animation project and then the shots get totally mixed up. It takes forever to sort that out. And sometimes they don't sort it out properly. And um, I stop motion just alleviates that problem. You, you don't, it, it is costly in a sense, I guess, because you need to buy one per iPad. But it's worth having. We've used it religiously over the last uh, probably five years close to that. And it's just made their work so much easier. We don't use the iStop motion remote camera at our school, but it's another option that you could try to use so you could activate the shots remotely um, at a distance. And that's another option too. But I don't think we'd be doing our, our stop motion projects the way we do without using iStop motion. This is an example of the dashboard. Uh, well, the, it's actually where the kids are taking their shots in a project. And I stop motion. I just wanted to show you this because you can see some of the different options that are available to you. Um, you see the kids have set their little Lego people up on Lego, and they've got a green screen floor. And that's that project I was talking about earlier in the year when we didn't quite have everything set up on the desk yet with the paint color. But you can see they can do single shots, and they can also do time lapse. The time lapse is super cool. I mean, set up your iPad for time lapse, let it go for a while, and and see what you can come up with. It's amazing. I did this at the at the front of our LRC, our Learning Resources Center, one day just to try it out, and it was fantastic just to see the movement that came in and out through those doors. Um, pair that with green screen, and you've got an amazing. Um, Amazing possibilities there for a project. Anyway, um, you can see that it, everything's in order. It tells you the timings for the different shots. You can duplicate shots, remove shots. But also, it gives you an option to onion skin. And if you're not familiar with the term, what onion skinning is, is it allows you, it's a way of seeing where your previous shot is. It shows up sort of as a tiny little semi-transparent skin behind your props. And you can see where the kids had their props in the previous shot so that the jumps between movements are not too great. 
we edit our uh, animation projects on iMovie. The majority of the students in seventh grade edit them on the iPads in iMovie, although at that point we do allow them to choose between the computers and the iPads. Again, most of them choose to stick with the iPads. It's what they're familiar with. It's a nice, simple movie editing application, and it lets you do a lot of stuff. And it's actually come a long way over the last few years, years since we've had it. Um, it. You know, the voiceovers are super important. Sometimes the kids do video work, and they know what the story is. They get it. But when you look at it, you're thinking, hmm, I'm not quite sure what's happening in this part of the story. And so voiceovers can help with for narration or text and subtitles, which you can also add in. And that just helps not only to understand what's happening in the story, but it helps to move things along in the story. They can add credits. They can add transitions. They can mute some clips if they want to say the, uh, they want to um, add audio for a certain portion, but not the other. They can, they can split it and, and remove the audio from another portion, speed things up, slow them down. And they can add their own themes, too, which is quite nice, as well as some music for the background, if that's something they'd like to have in their projects. Um, this is a, a screen capture of Doink, um, the app's uh, $2.99 in the App Store and iTunes. And it is, it's worth the, the money. I mean, it, it's not a very costly application, and it is very much worth what they're charging and more. You can do so much with this application. It is magical, really, when the kids get to work with it. Um, when you get started with it, I, I would suggest giving them, whether it's on paper or in a digital document, give them a structure to follow, give them a bit of um, scaffolding and have them actually write down what their images are going to be or their videos are going to be for the background and the foreground. And if they're doing three different layers, then have them actually put that in there. Because otherwise, what happens is they'll get it. They might get it backwards. It can be fixed. It's not the end of the world. But it helps them to plan how it works. And also helps them to better understand how chroma keying actually works. This is kind of, well, this is what it looks like once you're in there. This is a very simple example. And you can see I've used two layers for this. Um, one layer is my background image of the Learning Resources Center, on top of which I placed a piece of Lego, basically. And you can see that you have a chroma key filter switch, which you turn on or off. There's a cropping button. And you can actually add masks to it now so you can um, remove. Uh, parts of your background image if that's something you'd like to do as well by clicking on the track that you're using and then adjusting it as you need to. I had a play with um, the yellow in here as well and the blue, if you can see it in the color wheel. And depending on what your initial shots are taken on, it, it actually works quite well depending because what it does is when you add the filter and you increase the sensitivity, it removes that color from the shots where the green, blue, yellow, whichever color you've chosen as a background um, images. So it, it makes it transparent. And that's really the magic. That's how it works. I wanted just to pop this in because I think as teachers, we I know as teachers, we we need to really push this with our students. Um, they have a lot of bad habits, I call them. Um, they go they think that Google is just a free-for-all and where'd you get your picture got from Google? And so we, we teach them as part of our research process and as part of our project planning how to search for um, content that they're able to use, media that they are that's licensed for reuse or reuse with modification. And we come back to this in every single project we do depending on what they're using, whether it's images or, or other types of media. We also supply them with the links in those online lessons that I mentioned or in the templates for them to click and go to some of these sites initially in 6 and 7 particularly because they are not always used to doing so. And I think that if you push this enough, it comes through into other across to other subjects or their grades and they'll remember it as long as they're reminded about it every so often and again shown how to use it. Final videos. I mentioned this earlier. It's really, really useful as a teacher to have a folder ready for your final videos. And the reason is if you don't have it ready and the kids rush out and they don't upload it somewhere for you, then you've got to go through all the iPads and you've got to do this manually. And although it's a small job, it can take quite a while to do, especially if it's just one teacher doing it. I would strongly suggest if you are Google Apps, create a folder for them, share them through Classroom, Doctobus, or just using the sharing settings. Um, or 
fire or Dropbox, if that's something that's allowed at your school, ours is actually blocked because um, it was using up a lot of our bandwidth. So we're, st we're using Google Drive, which works really well for us. And we're still using it for the, for the project this year because it does work. And have a folder where you can collect everything in. You don't want your kids to have access to your YouTube channel. At least I don't want my kids to have access to my YouTube channel password and login. So they can't upload directly there. And I do want to, s to screen all the, of their work too before I decide what gets publicized to the world and what is not published to the world. And um, this is a great way of doing it. We have, um, initially when I created my, my YouTube channel, everything went on there. We were new to this, real news, and everything went on. And now I'm a little more, well, actually a lot more selective as to what gets put onto our YouTube channel. It's, it's quite big, and we put everything that's digital storytelling and of good quality onto our YouTube channel. So we've been using this, I think, since we founded the LRC back in 2008. And it's a really great way, one, of collecting your student content together, another great way of sharing it with the world. And it, makes, it publishes the kids' work. They become video makers, for example. And they're, they're published as directors and, pub and uh, producers to the world. You have to watch your privacy settings. And some schools probably wouldn't like you uploading your content to YouTube uh, and not making the videos private. I actually publish mine, most of mine to the world. I find this extremely useful when people ask me about some of the work we've done. I can share playlists with them. So a playlist of animation work, a playlist of um, advertisements the kids have done, et cetera. And also, we have our digital video awards every year. And it's, it's been growing in size each year. And this is a great way for me to put together playlists for voting on different videos, which I can then send out to my, my school and the community through um, Google. And I can send Google Forms out to them for the actual voting to take place. Another way of doing that, if you're interested in a, in a video awards and having the kids um, and the community vote is using Google Doc folders. They load up beautifully in Google document folders. There is no noise when they load them up. So it's just the video that they see. I wanted to, I, I couldn't do this presentation without bringing in so many sources of inspiration that I've come across when doing this. These people, these teachers, are doing such amazing stuff with green screen and green screening in their schools. And you, you can't not look at their websites and come away with something that makes you go wow and think, I can do that. And I'm going to do that with my kids starting next week or next month. Uh, the first one is Mrs. Brewis. I, Hats off to this um, teacher. She just has so many projects that she does using Doe Inc. and green screening. And it's, it's so worth checking out her website. So I do encourage you to take a look at it. She has bottles with little messages, moving messages in them. Um, she does, uh, takes a, a bus and puts a little green screen video working on the side of a bus as it drives by. There's just so much you can do with these applications that we're showing you today. Please do take a look at this particular website. Dryden Art, there's a lovely video that they've done here of the work that they're doing at their school with green screen and dough ink. And this is just a quick snapshot um, from the video. But again, do, do take a look at it. I think just from the snapshot, you can gather how powerful this work is for the, those teachers and students and, and their communities when they get to see the work. This iPad teacher historical news report is very similar to the sort of thing we were doing with our students. And you can see that basically in the fourth, and in the fourth um, picture there in the slide that the finished video is sitting within the newspaper article at the bottom of the page. And it doesn't have to be history. It's a great way of doing it. It could be anything. We do ours with geo, with the volcano eruptions. It could be an English. Um, it could even be an interview. It could be a famous author. It could be anything, really. The, the sky is the limit. And all you need is Doe Inc. Um, to produce it. If you want to get really fancy about your editing, add titles and all of that sort of stuff, then you will need an editing program such as iMovie on your iPads or Mac or, or any other one that you're happy to use. Because you can export the video from Doe Inc. and import it into these other applications to do even more editing if that's something you're interested in, in following up. There's a few more here that I could not uh, exclude from the presentation. They, they are doing some really cool stuff with green screens and the iPad and Doe Inc. again. And there's some QR codes there. But also, I know that Peggy is, is putting the links into the chat. Do follow up on this. Do have a look at what they're doing. It, it is mind-blowing. I know that's kind of a cliche, but it is. It just To look at what the kids are able to do with this and what teachers are having their kids do, it's so powerful. And I strongly encourage you to, to look at these other examples as well. 
I'm, we're at the end of my part of the presentation, but I'm here for Q&A if you've got any questions. I haven't had a chance to really look through the chat, so I'll do that at the same time too and see if there's anything that's come up that needs um, addressing. But please, if you've got questions or you'd like to comment or share some of your work with us, that would be fantastic. Thanks so much, Jennifer. I did capture some questions. Do you have students do self-evaluations and peer evaluations on their work? Yes, um, with the self-evaluation, it's, it's generally through our rubric. We have sections in it that are group work sections, mm -hmm. and then there are sections for the, the individual, how they worked within their group, how they performed their roles. And usually at the end of the unit, unless we run out of time, which has happened a few times because you can run out of time with these projects, mm -hmm. um, we have a, a, a screening. And so the kids um, screen the videos, they watch them, and they feed back on them. And you can do that through so many different um, methods. I mean, w just chatting about it, or you can use something a little more formal like Google Forms for voting or Socrates. But there's lots of options out there. Uh, mm -hmm. But we do have a screening. They do get feedback from the rest of their class and their teachers. We had two questions about Gubric. Could you tell us more about Gubric? Yes, um, Gubric is, a, is an add-on for Google. So what you do is you, you go to the add-on, they have an add-on gallery or store, um, and you basically install it into your, into your Google uh, Drive. And what it lets you do is create, you actually go to the spreadsheet option within Google Drive and you create a rubric there. And there's a certain way of, of creating it. There's tutorials on how to do this. But basically, you leave the A1 cell empty. <laughs> Put your values, I think it's across the top, and your descriptors down the left, or your, your headings, and then your descriptors within you know, your, your different uh, can uh, definitions for what they can do, things that they've included, things that they haven't go within the body of the spreadsheet. Once you've done that, uh, you then apply that through the Gubric add-on to a document. And you, as a teacher, can then really just it's, it highlights the different cells. So you select the cells um, for the different values and descriptors for what the students are doing. And it places them within their doc. So the kids can see this. And it goes right into their document once you've done that. And you can go back and modify it as well if that's something you, you know, if you want to do sort of on the go and, and progress through the, the project with it. And that's something we're very excited to be using now that we've got this new template for our students this year. We're going to be going full Gubric um, with our students. Terrific. Um, are overhead fluorescent lights, like in most classrooms, bad for green screening? I, I think that they can be a bit problematic. What you want to do is you want to have sort of a nice, constant, not too harsh light. Um, mm -hmm. We do have fluorescent lights on when we do it, because that's, what, of course, what we have in our right. studio in our classrooms as well. But because we ordered our green screen kits through Amazon um, Complete Kits, we've got, um, we've got softbox lighting, and we've got umbrella lights, and we've got, well, we've got quite a variety of lighting, actually, which we're able to use against the curtains. And also, we can focus them onto our green surface on our desk. Another thing that we were trying um, a few years back was using the um, sort of uh, gooseneck lamps that you get for mm -hmm. your bedside tables and using that to try to, to light our green surfaces appropriately. So I would suggest um, if you are doing this and you're doing it on a grand scale where you've got you know, screens up and, or, or, or using tablecloths on the wall or painting the wall, that you invest in some, some decent lighting for it. It just really picks out the hues properly and makes the uh, chroma key filter run properly. Um, let's see. So that, just to clarify, Gubric is a Google Drive extension or a Google Drive add-on. Yes, it's a Google Drive add-on. It used to be an extension. And then, uh, was it two years ago, I think, they started making their extensions into add-ons. OK. Um, and Doctopus is also a Google um, add-on. OK. Uh, I think the other questions I captured were answered already. Does anyone else have questions? Or I, I know there were quite a few people providing other information. Would anyone else like to share their experiences with using Chroma Key in the classroom?
Paula, would you like to share? Get on the mic and share with us. I'm not sure if Paula is actually still there. Okay, Maureen, you already have the mic. Yes, I just wanted to say that one of the things that I, I really like about working with Jennifer is the way she sets up the project. We spent a lot of time at the beginning of this presentation looking at all the templates and all the pre-green screen work. And that is so, so important for the kids to have it really framed and not the green screen part is, is the wow, cool part. But all the other work that um, Jennifer demonstrated was just perfect because you know, we all need a way to frame what we're doing in the classroom. And I really like that part of it myself. Thanks, Maureen. Paula, would you like to talk? Okay, I gave you the mic, I think. I'll turn mine off and you can go can ahead. You hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, Paul, we're hearing you great. Talk just a little bit louder, Hello. but you're coming through great. I'm not sure that you can hear me. Uh, okay. Okay, I'm turning up my sound. Sorry. I don't have my headset with me today, and I'm sitting outside by the Mississippi River right now. You can hear me. But anyhow, I wanted to share uh, that you need to do a Google search for a friend of mine named Connie Mulligan, who does miniature green screening with little puppet figures. And I saw somebody in the talk earlier put up um, the cheese from uh, Starbucks to uh, glue the the little figures, the little puppet figures in her little miniature green screen studios. And she does have a wiki space where she shares lots of great ideas too. So, uh, you know, check on Connie with uh, out an E on the end. Um, but anyhow, I've done some paper slide videos with my students and some other things, but I haven't tried green screen much, Jennifer. Thanks, Paula. There was another question that came in. Uh, are there links to the project templates, or can teachers find lessons for the, the framing of the use of green screens, like the, the pre-green screening content? Yes, um, I've added one link to the chat um, for Kathleen, but for anybody who wants it, that takes you to the main um, main web page where everything is linked off of for this project, so all of the, all the bits and pieces that you need are there. I'll, I'll also put a, a, a quick link in the chat in just a second for you to the, uh, the actual work that we give the kids, the workbook that we give the kids, the template. And that way, if you wanted to skip the other stuff on the web page, you can go right to the, the meat of it, basically, OK? That's wonderful. Uh, again, I think those were the only, the last of the questions. So we'll then move on. And I'll turn the mic over to Peggy for what's coming up next. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. This has been awesome. And now we all have lots of things that we want to go exploring. And the resources you've provided us are so valuable. So thanks a lot. And we hope that you'll all come back and join us in a future show. Next week, remember that we won't be having a webinar because we want all of us to be able to go to the Den Fall virtual conference. And that will be all day next Saturday. And um, I'll uh, drop the link in the chat. It's also in the live binder. And then on October 31st, we're going to have our October featured teacher. And I always say her name wrong, but it's Marcy. A bear, I believe. Paula, correct me if I'm wrong. And she's going to be sharing a lot of great things about maker spaces. And then on November 7th, we have a 
whole panel of teachers from Madison School District in Phoenix, Arizona, and they're going to be sharing a bunch of digital assessment tools, including, but not limited to, Kahoot, Socrative, Flickers, Google Forms, and Answer Garden. So I hope that you'll join us for all of those. Um, remember that the um, library conference is coming this week, and it is always fabulous. There are two days of the conference. Thursday all day is like the teacher um, librarian day with lots of really great presenters. And then Friday all day is the actual, actual library 2015 conference. So check out those links and try to participate in some of them. Everything is recorded, um, but if you can participate live, you get to ask questions and you really get uh, to be included in all of that, and they're all free. Isn't that awesome? Don't forget, fall uh, BERTCon 2015, and that's the link for it. And then all month long, till the end of October, is Connected Educators Month. So many of us have been able to participate in those events, and they have been fantastic. I mean, there's way too many to participate in all of them. But check them out. Go to their calendar and see what's coming up and see if there's something of interest to you. And Lori, I'll turn it back to you to take us out. Thanks, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest endeavor. He's gathered together all of his learning resources in one place, including host your own webinar. So you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate room like this one. As long as you hold your session public, it's a free session for you. You can nominate a featured teacher by using this form or the tab in the Live Binder in Resources. We are having an October Featured Teacher coming up in a couple weeks. As you exit the session, the Classroom 2.0 Live Survey should come up. Uh, the link should be in the chat box here shortly. There's also a tab in the Live Binder, again, in that Resources section. When you open the survey, at the bottom, you will find uh, two fields to request a professional development certificate. One is for your name, and the name prints out on the certificate. The other is for an email address. Please use a personal email address and not a school email address, because school's mail clients tend to block this from arriving to you. The video collection and audio collection from past shows are on iTunes U, so you can access recordings there as well as the RSS feed on the uh, Classroom 2.0 Live website, besides the full recordings. So there are many ways to get to back shows. Special thanks again to Jennifer Garcia, to Steve Hargadon, who's the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in today's show. Thank you so much for coming.